So um, I'm excited today uh, to introduce Professor Brandon Delaney. Professor Delaney is a leading expert internationally of the learning health system concept. Although his initial training in research was in health technology assessment, real-world clinical trials, and also research in family medicine, since 2003, he has worked in the area of clinical uh, informatics, being appointed to a chair in medical informatics at Imperial in 2015, and elected one of the first 100 founding fellows of the new UK Faculty of Clinical Informatics in 2017. He has had wide exposure to European, um, he has had wide exposure to European and US clinical in informatics through workshops and symposia. So prior to moving to Imperial, he was the Wolfson Professor of General Practice at King's College London. And in Piro, he works in the Institute of Global Health Innovation with research in artificial intelligence, cancer diagnosis, and learning system, e-source for clinical trials, and global e-health. He's a member of the Medical Research Council Data Science Strategic Advisory Group. His research is very interesting, lie at the intersection of health services research, the use of data in research and service development, and pressing clinical problems. And currently, there are three uh, areas of active research, including compu computable clinical guidelines and explainable AI, cancer diagnosis in primary care, and also evidence-based management and learning data in COVID-19. So, and today his topic is managing long COVID patients in primary care. Without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, Professor Delaney. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. Um, I'd also point out that um, I'm a practicing clinician. I'm a general practitioner and a quarter time partner. So it's two sessions or so one day a week, which for me is Fridays. Um, so I have quite a heavy hands on clinical. So I'm just going to share my slides. Okay, good. So, so let's, I'm going to talk um, in about two halves. So the first part is a, a very recent update. I sort of checked a week or so ago on the most recent publications in the, uh, the area of long COVID pathophysiology and therapy. And then the second half is applying that to, to the primary care setting. Now, I, I see quite a few long COVID patients as a GP. I think I collect um, patients. So we have about 15,000 patients in our practice, uh, and of which now about 60 are known long COVID. Um, I probably see most of those. So about a third of my workload on Fridays is, is dealing with, to some extent, patients with long COVID. So we start with the definition. Um, this is the WHO uh, definition, which was designed by a consensus group, it has a list of common symptoms. Um, it comes in after three months of onset. Um, and one of the key things here is that the WHO want to define long COVID as can't be explained by an alternative diagnosis. I, I think they're gonna have to rethink this um, because it's really not, clear what they mean by an alternative diagnosis is that that you know once we have a definite you know, a, a pathophysiology for long covid does that become an alternative diagnosis it doesn't really recognize that this is probably a syndrome for which there's no single cause but a mixture of causes in individual patients so i would see this very much as a work in progress um, so what's new? Well, we're starting to move into better epidemiology of symptoms. So rather than um, patient surveys and, and ad hoc cohorts that we, we had last year, we're now starting to get some proper case control studies. Um, so here's one from, from Denmark um, using um, SARS-CoV-2 test positive um, to define risk. And then looking at um, odds ratios, risk differences for the prime symptoms. So um, problems with smell and taste, um, obviously being 
Omicron um, here. Fatigue, very clear, risk difference of uh, 8%. Breathlessness, weakness, um, numbness, these are a patient's own terms, uh, myalgia, headache, dizziness, chest pain, flushes, reduced appetite, um, and then a few minor GI things down here. Um, so I think that gives us the run of uh, what patients complain of. My, my complaint really about this study is it doesn't seem to have gone into cognitive issues, which I think are a real problem for patients. So they couldn't explicitly ask for that. We've now also got um, beginnings of some studies, uh, in-depth studies of the immune system on, on groups of patients with um, well-defined long COVID. And a paper here from, from Nature Immunology showing a sustained inflammatory response, um, uh, measuring cytokines. I'll come into more detail with this on another study uh, a bit later on. Um, but also potential risk factors. And here, here's a very interesting one um, from Nature Communications, 215 individuals. So people who had a history of asthma were more likely to report long COVID related symptoms. And there was a de um, deficiency of one of the immune globulins, IgG3, which I think is quite interesting because um, one of the common theories around long COVID is that it's persistent immune stimulation caused by viral persistence because people aren't clearing the virus initially. So if you've got a deficiency of one of the char characteristics of IgG, G, you may not have such a good humoral immune response, rely more on your cellular immune response. The virus can then tuck itself away. Um, it's known to hide in monocytes, in gut cells, um, and cause a persisting cellular immune signal. So that, that's a very interesting factor there, the IgG. Now this is, I think, going to be seen as a critical paper. It's currently only available as a preprint. Um, it's from um, uh, Awasaki's group uh, at Yale um, and the Mount Sinai um, Rehabilitation Group. And it's a cohort um, of 215 individuals, the majority of whom were long COVID, it's about half and then three kind, different kinds of controls. Those who'd been uninfected, um, those who'd had previous proven COVID infection, but were unvaccinated, and those who were both infected and vaccinated. Uh, and it was an in-depth study of immune phenotyping, um, looking at circulating T cell populations, the humoral immune response, and cytokines and the antiviral immune response. The long COVID group complained predominantly of fatigue and cognitive issues, including foggy brain, so difficulty in thinking, uh, and memory, particularly short-term memory, which are the known cognitive issues around long COVID. A third of them um, on screening had um, clear-cut evidence meeting the definition of POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. More about that in a minute. And about and half of them are off work because of their symptoms. So these are pretty typical long COVID patients. Um, so what they found were specific signatures of both inflammatory cell populations and the antiviral immune responses. Um, the patients had elevated specific humoral responses to SARS-CoV-2 and they were persistent. They had um, perturbations in their glucocorticoid response, so um, a low morning cortisol level um, and raised cytokines, particularly interleukin-3 and interleukin-6. They didn't have any autoantibodies that they could find um, against a, a wide panel of screening, um, but they showed potential reactivation through IgM responses to herpes viruses. Um, so Zoster um, and also Epstein-Barr. So they ran a, 
both an unsupervised and a supervised machine learning approach. And they identified um, a test, if you like, relying predominantly, actually, the biggest component of this was the cortisol level, but also the interleukins and, and, and other cellular responses, produced um, a potential biological marker for patients with long COVID. So this is really quite important. It's not been peer reviewed yet, um, but it's from a very good group and it looks a very good study. So here's something to keep an eye out for in, in the literature, that we may well have um, a panel of things that we can test um, and show that there is a clear cut biological basis for this. Um, and here are the, uh, the possible biomarkers we've got here. Um, the cytokines up here and the cortisol level there. Okay. There's been some suggestion also that uh, um, autoantibodies in other studies, um, particularly looking at um, uh, viral reactivation inflammation. Um, and there are other, other studies like this one where there have been you know, large panels conducted to look for um, potential markers for this. Now, the other channel I think of great interest uh, has been that of what's happening in the blood. Um, so you may well have heard uh, the story about microclots um, and capillary blockage in long COVID. Um, and this is from Doug Kell in Liverpool and Reza Pretorius in, in South Africa, where they've been looking at potential for um, amyloid proteins, i.e. misfolded proteins, and particularly fibrin microclots in a number of chronic diseases for about the past decade, particularly uh, in diabetes and ischemic heart disease. And they found markers for this fairly quickly um, in patients with long COVID. The hypothesis being that these insoluble microclots are large enough to block up microcapillaries. A microcapillary is about um, eight microns, and these things can be up to 10 times that. Um, so it's clearly potential here. Um, and that uh, this blockage causes low tissue uh, oxygen and a number of other response factors to that. Um, so these can be identified by fluorescence microscopy. You can also show overactivity of platelets. So there's a whole hypothesis here around a hematological cause um, for long COVID. There's also, independent of this, um, studies which have looked at uh, hospitalized patients with persisting symptoms and, and looking at their endothelial function using the flow mediated dilatation that's putting a cuff up um, on someone's arm and then using ultrasound to measure the dilatation of um, brachial artery um, and you can see the response to having a, a large cuff which is a normal response um, of expansion of the endothelium and that this is suppressed uh, in patients post-covid um, so the endothelium is not functioning normally in terms of oxygen transfer that's another key component so Kell and colleagues have expanded this um, into the suggestion that the combination of capillary blockage and endothelial function leads to an ischemia reperfusion injury when you increase your tissue demand for oxygen. Um, and this is one of the potential explanations for a very key clinical feature of patients with long COVID, which is um, that uh, people have exacerbation of symptoms when they exercise. Um, so if you're, you know, that, that varies according to individual patients, but you get a, up to, to a day or a couple of days later, um, myalgia, fatigue, headache, feeling of exhaustion, and all the other symptoms that, uh, that rack up. And Cal and colleagues have suggested that this is because of a, a response to ischemia and reperfusion releasing reactive, uh, reactive oxygen species at cellular level in the tissues where the blood supply is being impaired. Okay. So again, this is a hypothesis and it needs uh, further study, but it's important. 
Now, a couple of other things um, which affect all patients, um, not just necessarily those with long COVID, it's becoming increasingly clear that COVID infection has um, an effect on the brain. Um, here's a very nice study from UK Biobank. So UK Biobank is a large cohort of patients who um, regularly have health examinations, questionnaires and imaging done. And this predates COVID by about 15 years. Um, from the cohort, they had 401 cases who had been affected with COVID and 384 controls who hadn't. And they compared the pre-COVID MRI scans and cognitive function with post-COVID MRI scans and cognitive function. Um, the scans showed both a reduction in global brain size and particularly around the limbic system. Um, and the cognitive stress showed a small loss of function, particularly around short-term memory. So here is definitive um, and, and well-controlled information that supports the fact that you know, long COVID patients complain of memory problems and, and, and thinking through problems and it makes their head hurt uh, to do this. But this is, you can, you can find it in people even who don't identify themselves as having long COVID. And that was in nature. And COVID is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, here is uh, another very important paper from the Veterans Administration database, um, about 150,000 uh, COVID, uh, COVID non-hospitalized patients and contemporary controls, uh, a large number there, about 5 million. So this is routine data from one of the um, HMOs in the US healthcare system, looking at the risk um, and the excess burden per thousand persons um, of a range of cardiovascular disorders um, stratified by the severity of their initial COVID. Um, but even in the green, the non-hospitalized group, there are significant increases on this. So I would put it to, to general practitioners on that, that in the future, and in fact, you know, from now onwards, we need to be seeing a history of COVID infection as an independent risk factor for stroke, ischemic heart disease, um, heart failure, thrombosis, P, et cetera. Um, and we're certainly seeing increased reports of these cases uh, around. And thinking about how that might be linked, going back to thinking about endothelial damage, platelet activation, microclots, we're starting to see a consistent story. So, where are we in terms of understanding what's happening in terms of pathophysiology? Well, we have the endothelial disorder linked up um, with platelet activation, failure of, of, of blood flow, and oxygenation to tissues, probably triggered by persistent viral, viral antigen. We have in the background the brain effects operating. Um, we may also have small fiber neuropathy. And in the middle, we then have a set of clinical things that you can identify without running these research level tests. So we can identify dysautonomia. I'll come on to all of this in a minute. We can identify mast cell disorder with patients. A small number of patients have got clear cut cardiac muscle inflammation, and at least a clinical diagnosis of microvascular angina. The neurocognitive issues can be demonstrated in patients um, and are very problematic. Um, last week I, I saw um, a very specialized surgeon um, who's been off work now for about four months. And her main issue is around spatial orientation and neurocognitive issues. And that's very, very serious. Um, you know, it's like being an airline pilot with this problem. So you need to think in an occupational way. Um, and also the effect of loss of work, social activity and functioning independently will have a big impact on people's mental health. So that then presents as a set of symptoms that we know quite well, um, which tend to cluster around. And I'll, I'll, I'll come over to this. In the UK, we, we now have actually from, from most recent, it's about 900,000 people with more than 12 months of symptoms. So how might this be related? 
Well, let's start out with COVID infection up here. And this is a, if you like, a, a thought piece. And the bits around the outside in the red are those symptoms that, that we've come across. So we've got people with urticarial rashes, bloating and reflux, cough, dysphonia, disturbed sleep, tachycardia, chest pain. And many of these symptoms end up causing fatigue themselves. Um, uh, and if you think about over here, you've got T cell abnormalities, autoantibodies, persisting virus, that endothelial dysfunction, the potential amyloid microclots, the small fiber neuropathy precipitating dysautonomia and POTS, the T cell and mast cell abnormalities expressing themselves as mast cell symptoms, so new allergies, urticarial rashes, etc. Um, and the brain um, relating, causing um, anxiety and depression, breathlessness. So you've got a network of things and you can't view a long COVID as just being one problem. It's complex, it's multi-system, but at its root, it has the interaction of persisting virus, the immune system, um, and the hematological and endothelial system. So, how does this translate into primary care? Well, let's, let's roll right back and think back basics. You know, I'm a GP. My, my role there is to, to listen to what the patient is saying, to have a challenging that is to empathize with them, to work with the patient, to find a cause in the problems. And these, these are challenging patients. It's not a sort of simple thing, oh yes, you've got such and such, I can prescribe you something or it'll get better. We don't know, there's a lot of uncertainty here. Um, you know, if one of our things is sharing our uncertainty with the patient in a way that the patient feels supported and it's a joint venture to try and find what's going to help best for that patient to be aware of the new things that are coming along and absolutely not to dismiss the patient's symptoms as being either not real psychological or just due to anxiety there's a massive overlap between POTS tachycardia for example and anxiety because they're both hyperagenergic situations to keep updated, um, to, to not fall into that duality trap. Oh, it's, it's all psychological. It can coexist anxiety. You would be anxious if you had a new condition like this. Um, to think a lot about non-pharmacological interventions, I've come across that. And also to think about the differential, both as long COVID in patients presenting with things like chest pain, breathlessness, fatigue, et cetera, but also the other differential diagnosis in these problems. So a patient with fatigue um, actually having a, a lung cancer, for example, and, and you know, to think through those, those potentials and make sure that, that things aren't getting missed. Um, the commonest presentation you see in primary care is fatigue and post-exertional symptom relapse. Um, and it's far more than just tiredness. It's a simple inability to do anything. Um, we also have breathlessness, particularly in the, uh, the patients in the, the earlier uh, point. Um, and the autonomic dysfunction that we often see translates in many patients into a disorder of breathing pattern. So they find um, speaking or doing anything else and breathing difficult to do at the same time. So the breathing pattern breaks up and they start to huff and puff and pause and, and it becomes quite difficult. And it's often misdiagnosed as anxiety. Inappropriate tachycardia, um, minor exertion or simply standing, chest pain, very, very common. Um, the neurological issues we've mentioned, um, the mast cell problems, um, and some, some patients get episodic fevers as part of their, their symptom relapse. And there is some route back from overexertion and kicking off an immune response, which is, you know, the cytokines, which are causing a fever. So often people feel like they've got a virus. Um, so thinking of red flags. Um, so exertional chest pain. You've got to exclude angina. Uh, from this, but microvascular angina and myocarditis are quite common. Many investigations of microvascular angina in these patients are negative. They're not exactly um, non-invasive. Uh, we have issues with 
um, stress perfusion MRI scans of adenosine and stuff like that. They're expensive, difficult to get hold of, long waiting lists, and quite unpleasant for patients. So, you know, perhaps we need to be thinking about um, doing coronary CT scans, cardiac calcium scores. And if those are normal, but the patient has a good history of angina, treating them as potential microvascular angina. Um, pulmonary emboli, especially in the first few weeks, I see less of it now, um, but we had a rash of people during, particularly during the Delta wave in the first eight to 12 weeks after infection who had quite pronounced breathlessness and tachycardia um, with a positive sit to stand test. Didn't have a raised D-dimer in all circumstances. It's not a very good rule out in patients who have a high pretest probability of a pulmonary embolus, um, but then presented to hospital and had either a number of multiple P's or a large, large pulmonary embolus diagnosed. So something to be aware of, um, particularly with those patients that, that seem perhaps a little bit beyond what you would normally expect for a typical long COVID patient. Um, and particularly if your sit stand is showing significant desaturation, that's not normal, you need to find a reason for it. So you can do that nicely in the practice with a pulse oximeter. Um, so baselines, um, thinking about it, thinking about the differential diagnosis, full examination. Investigations are mainly to rule out other causes. So blood workup, including things like thyroid function, B12, ferritin, folate, etc. Um, I think the minimum is chest X-ray, um, the ECG. Um, thinking about an echocardiogram depends a little bit on local resources. Full stop baseline: no patient should leave without being advised clearly about pacing. Um, that's the biggest and most important thing you can do with patients and don't recommend any form of exercise therapy as initial therapy. Um, it's, it's not part and parcel of managing long COVID patients that you'll make them ill, like MECFS patients. CBT, psychological therapy, not a primary treatment, um, only as an adjunct. Some patients have a lot of anxiety about their symptoms on top that may be helped by, by dealing with it, but it's not treating the underlying cause. Normal baseline investigations don't mean there isn't a problem. So don't be falsely reassured, particularly around D-dimer. Um, it, it doesn't have a good negative predictive value. Um, simple spirometry and normal chest X-ray don't exclude, exclude other pulmonary pathology. Um, may need to move on to MRI scans. Um, the role of the echocardiogram is quite controversial, but I think, um, I would, you know, if a patient's got positional chest pain, um, I would rapid track referral to cardiology uh, for looking at that. Um, I use quite a lot of um, halters, both 24 hours and five days, um, and to pick up arrhythmias. So 24 hour tapes of palpitations. Um, moving on, respiratory referral, lung function tests, um, transfer factor, it's quite important um, for picking out people who otherwise wouldn't be identified. Now, POTS. The paper I talked about um, from uh, Awasaki's group, they found that a third of their patients had POTS when tested against this protocol. So the active stand test with a heart rate increase to 30 minutes. Um, I think that every patient presenting in primary care with a diagnosis clinically of long COVID needs to have an examination to identify whether they've got POTS or not. Um, many patients don't quite hit the heart rate increase to 30 beats per minute, but they're more than 20. And I think they still have POTS. This, this is a consensus criteria. It's not a very well validated cutoff. Um, we see quite a few people who have a lot of symptoms are quite hitting um, this. Uh, it's very under-recognized and treating it makes people feel a lot better. It gets mistakenly diagnosed. So I'll give you a case example here. Um, 
I had a patient who um, whose job is stacking shelves in a supermarket. Um, she works in the evening uh, when the shop is, is empty and replenishes the shelves. Um, she relies on her work. She cannot take time off. She doesn't have very good sick pay. Um, so the, her employer has been quite helpful was trying hard with her to get some mitigation. So she was doing 30 minutes of stacking shelves and 30 minutes of lying flat and extending her working hours by two to account for this. Um, she'd actually been seen in our local long COVID clinic in South East London. And um, I was sent a summary, which included amongst other investigations, the results of a 24 hour tape, which included lots of episodes of tachycardia. I looked at it, well, blimey, that looks very POTS like. Um, the response from the clinic was it was probably due to anxiety and they were going to give us some CBT. So I, I brought her into the clinic. Um, I did a 20 minute active stand test with her, uh, which was clearly very positive. Her heart rate went up 40 from lying and was sustained over 10 minutes. Um, so we tried initially salt fluids and some compression wouldn't make much difference, um, tends not to. Uh, so we then moved on to pharmacological treatments. She has asthma, I couldn't give her a beta blocker, so I gave her a to bring her heart rate down. Um, that's because the otherwise her blood volume things were fine. Um, other options are midadrine and flutricortisone, uh, but I found the evaporating quite helpful here. I titrated it up over um, six weeks. Um, and her symptoms are almost normal uh, on that, and feeling very much better. So particularly fatigue um, and exertional malaise improves a lot when you treat people with POTS pharmacologically. Okay. Um, other suspicions for, for more widely for dysautonomia are loss of concentration, um, blue, blueness of the extremities, so we talked about the lean test down there. There's also, I've given a link here, I'm happy to share these slides at the end. So my college man of Sivan at Leeds has come up with a home functional protocol test, which is a bit easier in primary care. You give the, make sure the patient's got um, a, an autosphygmometer and they record their pulse and blood pressure against a variety of daily activities at home, which include rest, um, getting up in the morning, after meals, after uh, moderate exercise um, and some household tasks. Um, and I think that that's probably a, a good way of, of trying out the things that are going to exacerbate patients without having to pull them in and formally do their blood pressure measurements in a way that's going to make you really late in clinic. Though it is quite interesting when you see that, you know, after a minute, not much has changed, but five minutes in, often patients' blood pressure has risen slightly and that they really are starting to get a sustained tachycardia. You need to be patient. Um, with, with POTS testing. It's not, not just prick standing and sitting. Um, Non-pharmacological treatments we've, we've covered. Um, pharmacological treatments. Sleep disruption is a big part of POTS actually. It's, you know, the autonomic nervous system is really important for initiating sleep. The fall in blood pressure, fall in pulse rate, drop in body temperature. Um, really important to sleep initiation. If you're not able to do that, you stay too alert. Um, magnesium and melatonin help. Um, you can use beta blockers. Um, we use them on lots of things. I think GPs are quite comfortable using beta blockers so there isn't a contraindication. Um, Vabridine is actually fairly safe to use. The others you need to be a little bit more careful about, um, particularly midadrine, uh, with as um, uh, resting hypertension, uh, and that's co uh, contraindication, both for cortisone and mitridone, and they both need active and close monitoring on both response and electrolytes. So people may feel more comfortable doing that with, with a cardiologist in hand, on hand to advise. Um, and think about hormone replacement, uh, menopausal women. Um, it seems that HRT does improve uh, symptoms of long COVID. There's a big overlap between perimenopausal and postmenopausal symptoms. And obviously, as I'm sure you're aware, long COVID is more common um, in women. Um, coming up towards an end here now, mast cell activation syndrome. Um, 
whether it's called mast cell activation syndrome is a bit of a war uh, between um, the various clinical uh, Im immunologists. There is an um, American Association of Allergy and Immunity definition of mast cell activation syndrome, which is clinical, and it's episodes of either anaphylaxis or new allergy symptoms, urticaria, um, wheezing, um, GI disturbance, reflux, um, episodic, and that responds to antihistamines. So it's very clinical, and I think a very good definition for primary care. Um, in the UK and several other places in Europe, people don't like this. They think it's an overly broad definition, um, and you can only get um, uh, diagnosed with it if you've got a history of anaphylaxis and your tryptase measured within 20 minutes. Well, try getting that done in most healthcare systems. So it's, it's really designed to say it's not our problem. Um, so we've had a bit of a, a row with them about that. Um, there's an overlap between POTS symptoms and mast cells. Um, what I do practically is I look for dermographism in every patient. Um, and there's a strong overlap with the symptoms. So I can almost say this patient's gonna have positive dermographism. So make sure they're not already taking an antihistamine because many patients are. And then you just rub um, a, a sort of an end of a pen cap or a broken off um, tongue depressor, it's not too sharp. You just gently rub it down the arm, right, a little scratch. Um, a slight red mark is fine uh, after about three or four minutes, but if it wheels up and you get a flare, that's positive, and, that, and that by definition, their mast cells are reacting to that. Um, and a trial of treatment over four to six weeks uh, is, is very appropriate here. Um, and I use um, fexofenadine, uh, 180 milligrams twice daily. So that's the urticarial dose, but double uh, dose. Uh, and formotidine, 20 to 40 milligrams twice daily. Um, so it's double H1 and H2 blockade. Um, usually very well tolerated, but you have to watch out for the weight gain on that dose of fexofenadine. I find practically every everybody puts on about half a kilo a month. Um, so for that reason, I try and keep it to four to six months of initial treatment and then see if they can come off it. Um, quite a few people do. They can often go, and go back on it for a month or two if they have to. And just, just trying to avoid keeping on people on high doses. For a long time. I'm, I'm open about the dietary side. Um, I think some very high histamine uh, foods, particularly runny cheeses like camembert and things like that, can kick off a, a sort of semi anaphylactic reaction. But generally, I don't think low histamine diets per se make much of a difference. Um, and here's one I found um, just for you. Um, there's been a, sorry about the misspelling. Um, uh, an RCT um, of a combination herbal treatment of Chinese traditional medicine, um, looking at uh, long COVID. Um, it's reasonable size, reasonable powered RCT with quite encouraging results. Um, there is a, a lot of interest in long COVID patients on a variety of different herbal nutraceutical type therapies. Um, and I'm sure that you're going to find lots of that in the patients that you're seeing um, in Hong Kong. Um, how they work and how they fit in, um, I'm sure those who know more than I do about Chinese traditional medicine can suggest um, ways they're interacting with the various pathways that we discussed earlier. So I think bottom line um, is as GPs and as generalists, we have a very key role in supporting patients. Uh, in making a patient feel confident that their clinician understands what's going on, um, that there are limits to existing knowledge, but that we're working with the patient and we're not being dismissive. And looking holistically at the patient, thinking about their work capacity, their secondary effects from various things, other ways of supporting them with employment reports or, or other social care supports. Um, and at the end of the day, it's a new long-term condition. This is not going to be going away. We're still getting new patients with it. There are still patients two and a half years in who are not recovering. Um, and we need to think about how we organize the healthcare system effectively for dealing with this, how we get appropriate support for patients. And that we know that we have a register of long COVID patients. So when new treatments come along, 
we know that we can contact the patients and try it out um, to do that. Rehabilitation, I haven't mentioned very much. I think it is appropriate, but it has to be specialist long COVID rehabilitation. People who understand about symptom relapse, they understand about what to do, and that they've had appropriate medical assessment beforehand for that thing. So as in many health systems, kind of long COVID straight to rehab is not appropriate. Um, a few references there, and thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to uh, take questions, and I'm also happy to share the slides. Thank you very much for the very informative and useful uh, presentation, uh, Brendan. Um, we have uh, several questions from the audience. The first one is from Dr. Wendy Lowe. Um, she's also a family medicine specialist. Um, thank you for interesting lecture. Uh, like asthma, do you think bronchiectasis and emphysema may also be risk factor? There's a big overlap isn't there, between um, asthma and, and um, bronchiectasis and emphysema. So I think, yes, um, I, I, I can't show they didn't look at it in the paper, but clinically I would expect. Um, and also if you've got um, low IgGs, for example, that, that may be a predisposing factor towards bronchiectasis as well. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, I think that's a simple answer. Thank you. Um, so from Dr. Victor Seem, there are no initial exercise. When will you exercise your patient uh, presumably graded exercise? Okay, right, okay. Um, now, graded exercise. Um, graded exercise therapy, as defined by the trials of graded exercise therapy, I would absolutely not do with, with a, a long COVID patient. Now, the way that graded exercise therapy worked in the studies was that there was a specific and rapid step in exercise that was governed purely by time. And patients were pushed to go step up five days, step up five days, step up five days. Um, and those that couldn't tolerate that dropped out of the trial and dropped out of the analysis and the studies didn't assess harm. Um, so there is a lot of controversy around these studies, but I think a reanalysis has very clearly shown that graded exercise therapy, as applied the way it was specified in the trials of graded exercise therapy, is very harmful to patients with post-viral conditions. In practice, a lot of clinics that were using it were adapting it so that the patient, there was a degree of, are you tolerating this? Now, my colleague Manor Sivan and his rehab clinic in Leeds, they very, very carefully monitor what patients are able to do and their response to exercise. So what um, an expert clinic will do is they'll use the board scale of effort on exercise and keep the patients in the lower levels, sort of one to three on the board scale. So you're never pushing a patient up. And if a patient stays there for six months, that's where they are. Um, the key thing is not to make people worse. Does exercise help patients with long COVID? I think it helps some. I, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult to tease out. And if you want my, my hunch as a researcher in the area, I think there are probably two broad groups of patients. There are people who are quite fatigued through being ill for two or three months. So they're often people who've had the more severe COVID, whether they've been in hospital or not and they're taking longer to get over it. But you can see, you can see if you see them over about three or four months that they are improving. Their breathlessness is decreasing, their ability to go walking at home is okay. Um, they sometimes want to push it too hard and they relapse a bit and there you're just trying to keep them, you know, be aware of the board scales, tell them what a perception of effort would be, try and keep them, you know, from not overdoing it and they will get better. And then there's a group of people who are probably going to end up like the two year plus long haulers who seem to fluctuate according to a variety of different things. Sometimes exercise, but often all sorts of other stimuli it can be stress, too much cognitive workload, um, maybe a vaccination actually, or maybe another infection or another viral illness or another bout of COVID and they relapse again. Well, we don't know why they relapse again, they just do. Um, and these people carry on doing this um, and they're never going to really get back to what we would call exercise. And it's very, very frustrating. Um, so you've really got to adapt it. 
the image of a patient. The, the current best is to use the Borg scale. If you can't, if you're not familiar with it, don't use it. Refer them to a specialist physio who's going to work with them in that area. But please don't use graded exercise as specified. Um, and I'm very suspicious of any clinic that that says graded exercise unless they're very very clear what they're doing. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question from David Chen. In your experience, how long does long COVID last on presumption, uh, presuming no underlying complications? About half of patients who have symptoms at three months will still have symptoms at a year. Um, the studies pushing out beyond a year um, it's a bit more difficult because large cohort surveys like REACT2, which is a big cohort of Imperial, um, they haven't done a two year follow up yet. Um, the Office of National Statistics in the, US, in the UK, they don't have a consistent cohort with every time they survey the population. So as you get to these smaller numbers, it's very difficult to, to see what's happening. Anecdotally, from I'm, I'm aware of a large group of people, patients with long COVID, particularly clinicians, and also on our patient group. Um, quite a lot of people at two years plus are, are generally functioning and back to some kind of work, um, but they're still having to pace to some extent. They're almost certainly not working full time, um, and they are nowhere near what they were pre-COVID in terms of their abilities and functions. They're still disabled. Um, and it's that group that I'm most concerned about. It's very difficult for patients who've been ill for a year say, am I going to get better? And I say, well, maybe not, actually. Maybe you need to learn to live with this at the moment. You know, and hopefully there will be some, some stuff that will come on, you know, some specific immune modulators or something of that nature that might, might come up. Um, so that's that. Thank you. Um, again, from Dr. Victor Seem, is there such a thing as post-COVID vaccine syndrome? Yes, yeah, we've seen it. Um, it's difficult to measure. Um, and there's a, a lot of toing and froing between the different groups. But in, in terms of case reports and stuff, yes, definitely. Some patients do seem to have an adverse reaction. It's very, very much less than the chance of getting long COVID after getting COVID infections. So it's a kind of balance really, you know, and on balance, I would say to people, have the vaccine, because if you get COVID, then you've got a 5 to 10% chance, well, about a 10% chance of, of getting uh, long COVID um, within almost up to a year afterwards. Vaccination seems to probably halve that, so there's a bit of controversy around that. So it certainly is an improvement, whereas the risk of getting um, long COVID from a vaccine is really small. I mean, it's probably less than one in a thousand, but it, that can happen. Okay. Is there an overlap between POTS and also inappropriate sinus tachycardia? Um, POTS is the commonest form of dysautonomia that, that we're seeing, but you can get others. You can get inappropriate sinus. Um, you can get orthostatic hypoten hypotension. Um, so you... If I think clear cut POTS is very easy to diagnose in the clinic. When you're getting the others, I would like to refer to a dysautonomia clinic for a more precise tilt table testing to define that kind of thing. Okay, this is from Tian Yun Wu. Um, I'm curious what a long COVID clinic looked like. Could you introduce a little bit more about it? Are most of the patient only seen by GP? And what is your opinion about occupational therapy in the care of long COVID? So in the UK, we have um, about 90 um, locality-based specialist long COVID clinics that were set up with some funding from NHS England. Um, we are conducting a real world evaluation of 10 of those clinics. They, they are very heterogeneous. Um, some like the Leeds Clinic, um, the Imperial Clinic are and also the one at UCL, which is part of our study, but they're doing their own study. Um, they're multidisciplinary, um, both in medical and allied health professionals. So a patient will come in, will have a baseline clinical assessment by a lead clinician, either respiratory or cardiology. They would then be referred on to neuro, uh, rehabilitation, neurology, 
GI, cardiology, if they have specific problems in that area. And in the background, they will have specialist physiotherapy input, specialist OT input, yes, very important, um, to help them to cope and manage with their symptoms to avoid relapses um, uh, whilst having all those other investigations. They usually get seen for about six to eight months um, and some patients improve uh, with that and some don't. Um, it, it's a bit of a mixture. There's a need for all the clinics to follow up patients more systematically, which we're currently doing with our locomotion study. So every patient gets a patient reported outcome measure on an app. The outcome measure is called C19 YRS. It's a specific um, long COVID measure, which is actually very good to use in the clinic because you get a really good measure of how severe the different symptoms are. If you Google it, there's a website, C19 YRS, which has questionnaires and things on it. Um, and uh, we use EQ5D for quality of life. So we're, we're actually looking to see what's happening in the different kind of clinics as a sort of mm -hmm. experiment. But I'm a big fan of medical and AHP multidisciplinary clinics. Um, if you've got one, um, then I think it's good. And there's less to do as a GP. In South East London, I have to say my local clinic is awful. Um, they do uh, graded exercise without much pacing and CBT, and I've had some patients who've been calmed by that. And I've also had some misdiagnoses of you know, bundle pots that's been missed. I won't refer patients there. Um, so I do more myself. <laughs> um, does vaccination help to reduce the risk of long COVID? The UK study said, yes, it halves it. The US Veterans Administration study says it's only a 5% reduction. You pose your money and take a choice. <laughs> Somewhere between the two. I see. And uh, Dr. Wendy Lowe asked about, does probiotics uh, help with the long COVID? Very interesting question. Um, there is a bit of a literature on um, gut microflora, uh, microbiome, um, and uh, long COVID risk. Um, theoretically, there, should, there is an interaction between the propensity of your gut endothelium to get carry virus long term and your gut microbiome. It's a really interesting area of research. It's not really come out yet into the clinical world. Watch this space. A lot of patients are experimenting with things like that. Thank you. Area for um, a research project. <laughs> your, your, um, your talk has really uh, <laughs> stimulated a lot of discussion and question. As a patient, should they be treated along COVID similar to treating flu? Like, this is from Charlotte Germ. Any yeah, comments I mean, on that? Uh, what I, 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 when the cold stuff and things, it, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a common um, advice. That's fine. I don't think we know whether the answer is right or not. But what I do say to every patient and everyone I see or colleagues and stuff who have COVID is I say to them, rest. Do not try and work through COVID. Um, because um, now, confession time, um, I had long COVID myself. It's partly how I got into this area. Um, so I had COVID in March, early March 2020. Um, Pre-COVID, I was extremely fit, 58 year old. Um, I, I could cycle 160 kilometers in a day, no problem. I was a cycle fit training level at that thing. I cycled regularly with a club. Um, probably the fittest I've ever been in my life, actually, um, through doing that. I haven't been on a bicycle since. I just can't do it. Um, I get either chest pain or breathlessness or a symptom exacerbation. I had really bad cognitive difficulties um, and fatigue through most of 2020. Um, and was working part-time through that. So I was splitting my practice work, um, the half time that I was doing, which is equivalent to a say, mornings clinic, into two half mornings and splitting those up into um, 40 minutes of patients and then a gap where I could lie down for half an hour and then 40 minutes and working at home, remotely not going in anywhere because it would just wear me out for travelling. Um, it slowly improved through 2021 and in 2022, it's, it's been much better. Um, I still have a bit of residual microvascular angina. Um, so a lot of this stuff has been generated by 
both my own interest in the area and kind of getting into research um, in that and contact with a supportive group of doctors with long COVID um, that I got to know in April 2020. So um, I think all of us anecdotally were sporty, fit, marathon runners, cyclists, sports players of various kinds, type A personalities. We all worked through our COVID. I was just working, you know, long hours talking to patients and stuff while I was at home and things. We all went straight back out and did massive exercise. Day 14, I did a 50 mile bicycle ride. Came back, felt fantastic. The next day I couldn't get out of bed. Um, so what I say to people is treat it like athletes with myocarditis, where there's a very clear cut thing. You rest completely when you've got the thing. You don't try and work. You don't do sporting activities. You don't try and exercise at home. And for the six weeks afterwards, you very gently get back into things. You don't go straight back into uh, sporting activity. I can't tell you whether that helps or not, but to me, it seems the most pragmatic and practical advice for people who avoid falling into the same trap. I have some questions too, as as a as a GP. Um, do you recommend you know people who present with some of the symptoms, for example, um, a depressive or anxiety symptoms to to do all the investigation that you suggested or i mean um like some of the blood uh, some of the, some of the investigation do you think they should be more are they are they really symptom specific or or do you, in your long COVID clinic do, how, how do you how does it work is there like a, people with a pre-existing mental health problem is that you uh no like a, no pre-existing mental health problems but they okay. after having COVID, they they started to have depressive symptoms and anxiety. Okay, yeah. so um, I think I mean, it's a classic primary care problem. Is this mm. a primary mental health care problem? Is this person had disruption to their life because of the COVID you know, and its impact on them? Um, or are these symptoms due to something else? And the first question I would have is, is there any evidence that this patient has POTS or dysautonomia? Because all those would be there. So with POTS, either because of an endothelial dysfunction or because of small vessel neuropathy, you're not getting vasoconstriction when you stand up or otherwise challenge, say, after a meal or something like that. So your blood pressure is not maintaining for a normal vasoconstrictor response. Instead, the body is switching into hyperadrenergic overdrive to maintain your blood pressure, but your pulse will be shooting up. And it feels just like anxiety because anxiety is a hyperadrenergic state, but the cause is different. Um, so I would, the moment I would probably do very carefully do a NASA lead test. So that's 10 minutes lying flat, pulse blood pressure, lean up against the wall, feet about 10, 15 centimeters out from the wall, neutral response, stand, resting shoulders on the wall, blood pulse and blood pressure, one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes looking for normal blood pressure, or perhaps a slight rise, um, and a rise in, in a pulse rate of more than 30, but I'd accept more than 20. If they have that, I'll treat their, their, their dysautonomia and their POTS through one of the things I've talked about first. And if that doesn't improve their anxiety symptoms, um, then I would think, well, maybe there's, there's an addition of anxiety on top. If they've got a negative lean test, they've got no not much of a rise, perhaps 10 or something like that, then I may think, well, maybe it's anxiety and we can actually go down, down that route because I've reasonably excluded the dysautonomia. But I think it's absolutely mandatory to satisfactorily exclude dysautonomia before making a mental health diagnosis. What, um, what is the probability? Is there any research done to show what is the, the prevalence of uh, POTS in terms of people presenting with these symptoms? Um, anecdotally, it's high. We're, we're trying to get all our clinics to do it so we, we can do an estimate. They're coming back to us with about 30%. Um, the, Indeed, uh, quite high. Yeah, the, the paper of the 215 cohorts from, um, uh, from the Mount Sinai clinic um, again shows 30%. So I think it's, it's, there's starting to be a consistent uh, response. So, yes, it's high. Mm -hmm. What about other symptoms besides, let's say if someone just have depressive symptoms and fatigue, then you, what would you recommend? How should we screen for these? 
Um, I'd be thinking about, are there any other treatable causes for that fatigue? So you can get fatigue through the POTS type terms. You can get fatigue if you're getting microvascular angina. You can get fatigue uh, if you've got poor sleep quality. Poor sleep quality relates to dysautonomia. Poor sleep quality, you also get mast cell problems. So I'd be thinking about clusters around mast cells. I'd be, I'd be doing the, um, the Darius sign, the, the scratch test, um, and treating those if I the case. I haven't yet, and I've probably seen now about 40 patients, I think, in, in my practice. I've not yet seen anyone who has primary anxiety. I've seen a few people that have got anxiety on top. They're getting chest pain, they're getting inappropriate tachycardia, and they're getting very anxious about it. Um, generally, controlling the symptom and talking to the patient reassures them has improved their anxiety symptoms. Um, now, uh, I'm sure there are patients who do exist who've, who've got primary anxiety. I just haven't seen them yet. Um, but that they would be appropriate for CBT alongside. Well, is, is this similar to like people with depressive symptoms or is it less common? Um, I think people can get depressed. I mean, there have been suicides. Um, you know, if you've, if you've been off work for almost two years, you're in financial difficulties, you've perhaps lost your house, you may have had relationships collapse. Um, then yes, um, I, I absolutely, from the depression side, that's part of holistic medicine, isn't it? You, you need to be aware of that. Any chronic condition can put you into that situation. I don't think long COVID is different, but it's a disabling chronic condition. Any patient with a disabling chronic condition is at risk of depression and it needs picking up and treating. Um, there have been a couple of doctors who've committed suicide and I think it's tragic. Um, but yes, absolutely. Very useful advice. I just my see if there's other question. My last question is, um, you, you I, I think in your slide you talk about the CBT cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't work. Um, is that maybe doesn't work for anxiety uh, or other mood symptoms? You, you also will yeah. recommend if, against that. If you've got if you've got depression and anxiety alongside, as a result or secondarily to your long COVID, then yes, it will help because we because we know it does help. But it won't, if you've got physiologically driven long COVID symptoms because of cognitive problems, dysautonomia, um, MCAS, severe post exertional symptom exacerbation, no amount of CBT is going to change that. Thank you, very, very useful. Um, I think everyone will agree that we have a very fruitful and informative uh, seminars. Uh, and I hope that uh, there will be more publication and research coming out such that it can inform the practice of, uh, you know, primary care physicians, because I think sometimes we we don't have enough information to, uh, or, or the infrastructure or the support that we need sometimes to, to uh, manage long COVID patients uh, in various settings. Yeah. Um, well, the world over. We, we've got our... Um... A paper in press with the British Medical Journal, which uh, summarizes very much what I've been talking about. So keep, keep an eye out on that in the next four to six weeks. Wonderful. Um, so, um, so I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank again uh, Professor Brendan Delaney for the wonderful talk. 